So we're in Christology part three, chapter 10, the risen savior, okay? Now, uh, Easter is a one-time event in our churches, and you guys know that Easter is a Sunday that rolls around uh, once a year, and it's a, it's a day that we celebrate uh, the Lord's resurrection, right? I mean, it's pretty simple. Unfortunately, in our culture, Easter Sunday has become more than just celebrating Christ's resurrection. I wish that that whole day was just focused in on, you know, worshiping the living Christ and taking that message to lost people. But as you guys know, here we are in the buckle of the Bible belt. And for us, that day um, has morphed. We do come to church that day. But there are a lot of people, of course, that just come to church a couple of times a year. And if they do just come one time a year, it'll usually be on that Easter Sunday. So it becomes more of a tradition. Uh, it's, a, it's a day that we traditionally come. Our families, we can get our extended family members to come on that day. Hence, one of the reasons I always take that day and as clear and concisely as I can, I present Jesus to that you know, congregation on that particular day. Nevertheless, it's a day that we come out of tradition in a lot of ways. Uh, secondly, there's other traditions that it has morphed into, you know, um, we pay a lot of attention to our clothing on that day. And so it's a day that we traditionally dress up, even if we're like our church, more casual and dress, semi-casual. Um, and yes, and so there's Easter bunny traditions. Uh, some churches, I don't want to start a fight, but they hide eggs and allow their kids to <laughs> chase eggs and look for eggs and things of that nature. Uh, but... Um, Truth be told, and you guys have probably heard me say this from the platform, there's a sense in which we celebrate the risen Christ every single Sunday, not just on Easter Sunday. And that is because the early church uh, began to worship and meet on the first day of the week, mainly because uh, Jesus Christ rose again on the first day of the week. And so even the chosen day for our Christian Sabbath, and I put that in quotes uh, you know what I mean by that, I hope. Our day that we've set aside for worship uh, is Sunday based on our Lord's resurrection. So, uh, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that uh, the resurrection of Christ is obviously more than just something we need to think about just once a year. No doubt about that. But secondly, the implications of the resurrection of Christ are vital for many aspects, not the least of which is, if we don't have a resurrected Savior, we don't have a salvation. And it's, it's literally, I don't think it's an overstatement to, stay, to say it is the capstone of Christianity. Hence, one of the reasons so many atheists and agnostics and Christ haters have attacked the doctrine of the resurrection. Uh, because if you can attack the doctrine of the resurrection, the, and somehow um, poke a hole in the resurrection in terms of some philosophical argument or some denial of the resurrection, then really Christianity crumbles. We don't have a leg to stand on. Now you guys know that it's been over 2,000 years and uh, our Savior, or about 2,000 years anyway, our Savior is um, certainly a resurrected Savior and though Satan has tried to um, cause and create doubt and um, tried to bring down the Christian faith by um, through various avenues attacking the doctrine of the, the resurrection. Um, he has not been successful and he won't be successful. There's no doubt about that. So um, you have men like a man that was born in England. His last name is Morrison. I don't recall his first name off the top of my head. I didn't plan to share this illustration. I want to say, um, well, regardless, his name is Morrison. He was a young lawyer there in England, and he um, determined that he was going to attack the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ, and he was going to use all of his skills that he had acquired in law school to look at the evidence. And his point was is that he's going to look at the evidence, and then he was going to write a book that actually criticized the doctrine of the resurrection, denied it, doubted it, and he was going to uh, bring down Christianity from that perspective. 
Well, uh, Mr. Morrison um, did all the research, and as he was researching, you guys know where I'm going with this, uh, not only did he come to the conclusion that Christ Jesus rose again from the dead, because when you look at the data, even the same data that would be accepted in a court of law, it's undeniable. And that's using not only biblical sources, but extra biblical sources and everything. Um, eyewitness testimonies and things like that, which we have. Um, it, it, he came to the point where not only did he not deny the resurrection of Christ, but he actually embraced the resurrection of Christ, became a believer, and then he turned around and he wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? And uh, he wrote a book actually defending the resurrection of Christ. And I love that story. It just, it just kind of lets you know that the devil can attack um, the Bible, the devil can attack doctrine, and he is not going to win. He's not going to be able to cast doubt uh, upon the Word of God. And so for 2,000 years, the old ship of Zion uh, that has been propelled by the Word of God um, has taken some hits, but she's still sailing on and sailing strongly. Uh, men like Voltaire, the famous French atheist, I'm preaching now, I'm sorry, but the famous French atheist stood up one day and in his house he declared that the Bible was a farce and that he was going to um, destroy the Word of God. Well, after he died, there was a printing press set up in his own house and they were printing copies of the Word of God. I love that. And so um, the Word of God, of course, will stand forever and ever and ever. Uh, and so uh, the same thing is true of the doctrine of the resurrection. So you hopefully had time to look at this smaller chapter, which I got a breath of fresh air last night. I woke up at 2 a.m. I can't explain it. I was up at 2 a.m. I still had about seven or eight, maybe nine pages left to read. So I was reading this chapter last night, about three in the morning, to be honest with you, finishing up my reading. And um, I had a hard time going back to sleep because it was so good, to be honest with you, as I finished up uh, my reading for this particular chapter. In retrospect, also, I probably could have, you know, last week when I was short on time and I decided to do question and answer time with you, um, in retrospect, I probably should have just powered through and powered through. And I, I, I know I could have taught this chapter last week, most likely, in retrospect. But uh, that being said, I love this chapter. I love it for various reasons, not the least of which is it doesn't uh, take a theologian to follow the reasoning in it. It's very scriptural. Uh, there are a number of uh, points presented by our author that are just edifying, for lack of a better term. They just, they just bless you. And so Paul um, argued for the doctrine of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You guys know we're in a series, and maybe by the, the, the time the rapture takes place or the millennial kingdom, we'll get to chapter 15 uh, in the main auditorium. That being said, uh, Paul argues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he says, here's the gospel, verses 1 through 3, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and raised again according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. And so the resurrection is actually, and the declaration of the resurrection is actually a part of the gospel. You're not preaching the gospel. It's not good news unless Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And then Paul begins to defend by saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll paraphrase some of his major points, but things like this. If there is no resurrection, that means Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, then our faith is in vain. Um, and our preaching is in vain. Let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Paul is saying, if Christ has not been raised, we don't have a salvation. And what preachers have been doing by declaring Christianity is they've been lying to you. And uh, it's, it's a very, very strong argument for the importance of the doctrine of the resurrection in the life of the believer. Um, you know, in Acts chapter 17, Paul was preaching to the Athenians, a very erudite crowd, uh, you know, um, and they came together in the Areopagus and they were on Mars Hill. By the way, one of these days I've been to the Holy Land, but I've never been to that part of Europe and um, you know, um, where Paul was. I've never been to literal Athens, but I want to go to Athens. Uh, I've been to Athens, Georgia. I don't know if that counts, but I've never been uh, to the, the, the uh, Athens that we're talking about here, um, uh, the Greek-speaking Athens. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, Paul was standing there in Athens, and that was the center 
of, again, the intellectual, um, uh, it was the center of the in intellectual world in that time. I mean, they had obviously philosophers there. Paul actually in Acts chapter 17 throws somewhat of a curveball. He quotes two philosophers there in Athens. Um, and they're listening to him, by the way, in Acts chapter 17. They're listening to Paul. Um, and then something happens. Paul mentions the resurrection. And once Paul hits on that doctrine, not only that, that God calls every man to repent, but when Paul says God has proved that every man needs to repent by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And by the way, what that is saying is, is that the resurrection gives proof to men that one day they're going to stand before the Lord in judgment. And I heard something that rocked me one time concerning those that come to church on Easter that don't really understand the meaning. If they come to church and they celebrate the resurrection and they don't follow Christ or give their lives to Christ, if they're there celebrating Jesus' resurrection, according to the book of Acts, they're actually celebrating their own future judgment, which is a hard thought to swallow. They don't know it, but they're actually celebrating the fact that because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, they're going to stand before him and he's going to be the judge of their lives. And that's what Paul is saying there in the book of Acts chapter 17. So when Paul mentions that, you guys remember the response. Some scoffed. They mocked him. So, and that was probably the majority. They just, as soon as Paul mentions resurrection from the dead, Christ Jesus rose again from the dead, many in your crowd, they're done at that point. So, and they mocked him. They laughed at him. Uh, Brother Gary, I don't know if you've ever experienced this as a preacher, but one of the hardest things to swallow is that when you're preaching the gospel, and I've been on the mission field a number of times and faced a lot of things, but one of the hardest things to deal with as a preacher is when not somebody necessarily stands up and opposes you, but maybe even harder than that is when somebody laughs at you for your faith. And I've literally experienced that. And um, Paul experienced that when he mentions the resurrection. They scoffed, they mocked, um, because, and you guys remember in the chapter, the Jews essentially, or I'm sorry, the Greeks essentially believed that essentially the height of salvation for them was for the spirit to be separated from the body. You guys remember that? So, I mean, for them, it was all about get rid of the body so you can be in the spirit, okay? And so when Paul says God's going to raise the body from the dead, that hits them right square in the eyes and con you know, immediately confronts where they are theologically. And of course, uh, many mocked him. Others said, we'll hear you again of this matter. So you got those that rejected, outright rejected Paul when he talked about the resurrection. Secondly, you had those that, I call them the procrastinators. You know what I mean? They said, hey, we'll hear you again. And our author says, which is a unique perspective, I always took that to mean that those men were essentially saying, Paul, I'm procrastinating right now. I'd like to hear you again. But as our author said, it could be one of these deals like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll hear you again, preacher. You know, it could have been that type of rejection. Um, and that, that was just an interesting thought that I got out of the chapter. But you have those that reject, those that procrastinate. But then the third group is what? The Bible says, but some. I love that. Some believe. That's it. Some believe. And so there, were, there was a handful there in Athens that believed the gospel and believed the resurrection, and they were saved. It's a beautiful thing. Now, Paul was ran out of town, and he ran out of town. He wasn't able to write to the Baptist messenger and say, hey, we had 5,000 saved. Um, you know, there was no big celebration in Oklahoma City over what happened in Paul's ministry during that time. But um, there were a few saved, and the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ was key and central in Paul's preaching. And really, when you study the book of Acts, early uh, apostolic preaching had uh, a single note that was constantly played, whether it was Peter preaching, whether it was Paul preaching, whether it was James, uh, whether it was, um, who was the first martyr? Um, Stephen? Yeah. Any of those guys in the book of Acts? Uh, they always preached resurrection of Christ. 
and because it was such a vital doctrine. But it was also, as you guys know, a very dividing doctrine. Now, the, I told you the reasons the Greeks re, you know, rejected it. The reason that the Jews had a hard time with it is that it didn't necessarily totally fit their, their scheme, uh, their eschatological scheme. That's a big way of saying the Jews had a mindset that essentially when the resurrection of the Messiah happened or the resurrection of the dead happened, then that would bring on what was called the day of the Lord. And there's a little chart you guys might remember in the book. And essentially it's like this. This is the kingdom, right? And um, this is the cross point in the kingdom in which the resurrection takes place. On this side, you have time leading up to the kingdom. But once the resurrection takes place, then you have the day, Yahweh, or Yom, okay? Um, no, I won't write it in Hebrew. I'm just going to write it. The, the day of the Lord, okay? So, again, here's, here's the timeline. This is the kingdom of God. You're going throughout the kingdom. When the resurrection takes place, that's going to start the day of the Lord. That was the Jewish, Jewish mindset. So the resurrection, which happens right here, actually brings the uh, coming kingdom. Okay? That was the Jewish mindset. As you guys know, however, um, that is not how the New Testament and how the Messiah... Um, came and inaugurated the kingdom of God uh, in terms of the day of the Lord. In fact, our author talks about, and I hope I said that correctly. I hope you're tracking with me. Um, you guys know that the Jews of the first century had a tremendous problem because this is what they expected, but this is not what happened when Jesus came and was resurrected. Messiah came and he died and was resurrected back here. And so you got the kingdom of God happening. You have Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection happening here. And it didn't immediately bring on the day of the Lord. By the way, the day of the Lord, Brother Gary, is the seven-year trial and tribulation. It's the tribulation period in terms of eschatology, in-day events. The day of the Lord hasn't happened yet. And so it threw them off for the early Christians to be talking about the Messiah has been raised from the dead. And by the way, you remember another something that happened when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. The scripture says some Old Testament saints got up with him. That was a significant event, you know, um, for, um, you know, those Jews in the first century. So the resurrection takes place here, but the day of the Lord doesn't come. The kingdom does not come. Jesus does not set up his kingdom yet and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Essentially what you have is if you have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and then you have a time period in here leading up to the day of the Lord. Of course, we believe the rapture takes place right here. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, uh, but regardless, um, there's a death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, the, the rapture and the second coming of the Lord, okay, that, that happens. And I put those very close together. Technically, I guess if you wanted to put it on the timeline, it would be here. Um, we'll leave the day of the Lord right there in between. And here is when the Lord returns. And this is the millennial kingdom and where he sets up, you know, his earthly kingdom. But here's, here's what gave Jews fits. The Messiah died here, was buried, and was raised again. But the day of the Lord didn't begin. It was inaugurated here. Jesus got the victory over Satan. We talked about atonement theories a week or two ago. Jesus got the victory here, and he defeated death here. But basically, you've got this time frame in between in which Jesus is, and they couldn't quite get this, he's reigning from heaven, and he's reigning in the hearts of humanity right now. Uh, and um, that future kingdom and that future day of the Lord is actually um, to come. So scholars, and I love this terminology, have described what the New Testament, New Testament presents as already, not yet. It's already inaugurated, Jesus' resurrection. He was the first fruits. 
It's already, but it's also not yet. His kingdom is already. He reigns right now in our hearts. He's reigning from heaven. He's the Lord of glory. He's seated at the right hand of God right now. But there's coming a time that's not yet that Jesus is going to actually split the eastern sky, come down, and literally reign and set up his earthly kingdom. And so we live in this already not yet tension that, again, the first century Jews and the Hebrews, they didn't... Uh, it, it, it was odd to them, the fact that the early church would be talking about the Messiah's resurrection, and yet the day of the Lord hadn't come yet. So that was their curveball. They did believe that the resurrection brought on uh, a significant event in, in terms of the kingdom, and so they, they agreed with Christianity in that, that sense, but they, didn't, they, they couldn't quite get it. Now, I wish I could talk to you all day about the Jews and their misunderstanding of the kingdom. I really do because you read in the book of Acts, I'm not, we're not just talking about religious leaders. I'm talking about the disciples themselves not really understanding this already not yet tension. Even after Jesus is died, he has died, was buried and was raised again on the third day, he's talking to his disciples, Acts chapter 1 says, for 40 days. You know what he's talking to them about? The kingdom of God. And do you remember the question that was asked of Jesus by the disciples before he was raised in his ascension? Are you going to restore at this time the kingdom to Israel? They're asking him right up into his ascension. The disciples are asking him, hey, Lord, is it now time for you to like set up your kingdom right now? And um, now that, listen, if there was no literal millennial reign or millennial kingdom or kingdom in which Jesus was going to actually reign on earth as an earthly king, if, if none of that was true, that's Jesus's per perfect opportunity to say to the disciples something like this. Oh, you're asking me, when am I, you know, am I going to set up my kingdom? You've got it all wrong, guys. I'm going to reign from heaven spiritually. There is no earthly kingdom. It's his opportunity to set them straight. Or I've already you know, set up my kingdom and it's a spiritual kingdom. That's his perfect opportunity to do that. But that's not what Jesus says. He answers by saying, when they say, are you going to set up your kingdom? I'm paraphrasing there. He answers by saying, it's not for you to know the times. And so he doesn't deny the fact that he is the day of the Lord is going to come in the future and he is going to set up his literal kingdom. He doesn't deny that, but he lets them know, Hey guys, you just don't have the timing down yet. And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, uh, all in the Lord's hands. So does that make sense? Isn't that kind of an amazing thought? And, and what I'm trying to get you to see is, again, this already not yet tension, even the disciples didn't necessarily grasp the significance and, and how the kingdom worked. Those parables uh, in the scripture where Jesus is talking about, you know, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. You look at those parables and it makes tremendous sense that like, during this period here, oh, I don't know, what's one of them? Um, uh, there's going to be a field sown, and it's going to have wheat, and it's going to have tares. And at the end, uh, the tares are going to be separated from the wheat. One of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to go out there and start trying to separate wheat from tares because you can't tell the difference. That parable right there is just one of a multitude of parables in which Jesus is talking about. There's coming a time, it's an interval between his resurrection and act, the actual day in which he sets up his kingdom. Um, this would be called the inauguration of the kingdom, but this would be called the actual coming of the kingdom. There is coming, and really it should be out here you know, when he actually returns, but regardless, there is coming... Um, a day, and it's this little time period here that they couldn't cut quite grasp, in which believers and non-believers are going to be uh, living together. In the day of the Lord, they're separated. But in this little interval, they're going to be living together, and you're not going to be able to know the difference in terms of who's actually saved or not. But at the end, when the day of the Lord comes, then the angels will come. And by the way, don't try to judge somebody's salvation and that kind of thing, because again, you're in this interval. Everybody tracking with me? And that's one parable. That's just me off the top of my head with one parable. There are many parables that deal with this interval here, the already not yet tension. And um, again, 
uh, the first century Jews, they just, they, they stumbled. Even the disciples didn't get it until later. Now they, once the day of Pentecost happens and the Spirit of God comes and it clicks and they understand, you know, Peter's called to preach to the Jews and even to go to Cornelius' house and preach to the Gentiles. They understood that, oh, the gospel's just not about the day of the Lord and him raining down fire and brimstone upon Gentiles, but it's also for us taking the good news to Gentiles as well, which is that interval, the age of the Gentiles, the age of grace, whatever you want to call it. When that clicked in the mind and the heart of the disciples, they started preaching the resurrection and they started declaring the kingdom of God uh, was already not yet. And Jesus' resurrection declared it. And he's commanded every man in this area to repent. And uh, so it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to understand the significance of the resurrection. And, and more than anything, to understand the reason that even your Jews, even your disciples, didn't quite get it until later. And um, it's, it's vital, I think, even for a, a, a Bible student like yourself to have a small grasp of that. So much of the text even as you read the Gospels, won't really make sense unless you understand. Like when Jesus says to Peter and the disciples, okay, but who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God, right? And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not shown this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And Peter's happy at that point. Peter then says, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be resurrected. He literally says, I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected. Wait a second, Lord, Peter says. Let me give you a theology lesson. That doesn't fit this scheme. When Messiah doesn't die in my scheme. And number two, the resurrection immediately brings the day of the Lord. And you're talking about dying and being resurrected. Um, and he, he didn't understand it. And so then Jesus looks at him and says, shh. Don't tell anybody. And it's called the Messianic secret. And I truly believe it's the Messianic secret at that point because they hadn't yet grasped the truth of the kingdom, that there is an already not yet time. And then once the disciples, of course, did grasp it, then he said to them, go tell the whole world. Let them know that the kingdom is here. You need to receive Jesus now. And yet the kingdom is going to come uh, in the future. And... Um, the resurrection actually inaugurates that and starts that. Again, the agreement with the Jews, first, first of all, the disagreement with the Greeks is no, body, no bodily resurrection, it's not needed, so they threw it out. But the agreement of the Jews was, yes, the resurrection of the Messiah and of his people does bring on some sort of eschatological kingdom. It has some type of kingdom ramifications and they were right about that they just didn't quite get this yet and so um it's an already not yet and 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 i i just i love the story i'll probably use it in a sermon one of these days um i've used it in the past but the difference between he was talking about world war ii gary i know you like this one too the difference between um you know d-day and v-day did y'all do you remember reading that you know, there was a D-Day, and correct me if I'm wrong here on my history, I didn't look at this real recently, but correct me if I'm wrong, there's a D-Day, what is that, 1946? Um, let me see, the D-Day, yeah, June 6, 1944. Um, and so D-Day, obviously, is when the Allied forces um, stormed the beaches of Normandy and invaded Europe, right? So um, that's a big day, that's called D-Day. Okay, so when that happened, everything changed in the war. Um, the victory at that point on D-Day was guaranteed. Okay, but V-Day, Victory Day, doesn't come until almost a full year later. And so I love that illustration because it lets you know that um, there's an interval between D-Day and V-Day, and there's an interval between D-Day for the devil. Are y'all tracking with me? There's an interval. Jesus dies, is buried, and he's raised again on the third day. And that's D-Day for the devil. Jesus overcame him and defeated death, hell, and the grave. But yet V-Day, the victory day, comes later. And so in between D-Day and V-Day, we live in this already not yet tension. And um, 
So the way the author says it is that another sign of the inauguration of God's kingdom, uh, his rule on earth, may be seen in the nature of Christ's resurrection. Um, he was um, um, raised again from the dead. Uh, and he says, during this interval, in V-Day and D-Day, this interval, to be sure the devil continues to resist his inevitable defeat and inflicts casualties upon humanity. Yet Satan's demise is inevitable and will occur at world history's spiritual equivalent of V-Day, the return of Christ. I just love that. I just, that's just good stuff. That's enough right there to close the book, say that's pretty darn good. Uh, praise God for that. All right. So then we have uh, the meaning of Christ's resurrection. And again, guys, this is, we could probably just take, in fact, I know we could, we could take this litany of what it means and uh, we could take literally a class for each one of these and just unpack it, look at passages and things like that. that. But the meaning of Christ's resurrection. The primary meaning of the resurrection then is that in Jesus Christ, God has inaugurated his kingdom rule on earth, a rule which shall be consummated in the future when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that's, that's Isaiah 11 verse 9 uh, in terms of a reference there. And so um, that's the main reason, one of the main reasons for Christ's resurrection. He talks about the resurrection of Christ is, and now listen to this litany. It's God's declaration of Jesus' divine sonship. Okay? So, how do you know? Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, right? How do you know that He's the Son of God? God the Father raised Him from the dead. Oh, by the way, for the fun of it, who raised Jesus from the dead? Which member of the Trinity? The Bible says God raised him, his father raised him from the dead. The Bible says the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. But then the Bible also says, says there's just this sense in which Jesus just said, you know what, I'm just ready to get up. <laughs> and he raised himself from the dead. And so all members were active in the resurrection. And one of the things that his resurrection does is God the Father was... And I believe it's 2 Timothy 3.16, if I'm not mistaken. God was giving proof that what Jesus said, particularly about himself, was true. So, C.S. Lewis said, he's liar, he's lunatic, or he's Lord. Okay, He said, I'm the son of God, did he not? All right, so he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Okay, How do we know that he's not a liar or a lunatic? He claimed to be the Son of God, and God said amen when he raised Jesus from the dead. That's how we know. So it lets you know that everything he said about himself was true. Uh, number two, the resurrection confirmed that Jesus was perfectly righteous and therefore an appropriate representative rather, and substitute for sinful human beings. How do we know that his atonement was acceptable in the eyes of God the Father for our sins? God raised him from the dead. It just doesn't get better than that. Okay? The resurrection number three dem uh, demonstrated Christ's victory over death and the power of the devil. How do we know that he overcame death and the power of the devil? God raised him from the dead. Um, number four, the resurrection not only witnesses to the final salvation of God's people, but may be call called the cause of believers' justification, regeneration, new birth, and final resurrection. And so let me just pick out one of these. How do we know that we are going to be raised in the future to live with our Lord? We know because Jesus was raised uh, from the dead and that he is what the Bible calls the first fruits of those that have faith in him. And so Jesus' resurrection, let me put it this way, guarantees our future resurrection. And that's just one thing in that sentence. Um, and then uh, next point. The resurrection brings redemption not only to the people of God, but also to the entire order of creation. You guys know that the entire order of creation groans. Not just humanity fell into sin, but you guys remember with Adam and Eve, the whole creation fell into um, disorder and chaos, if you will. Uh, and Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 8, the, the creation groans. Well, 
The resurrection of the dead guarantees that Christ is going to redeem not only humanity, He's going to set creation straight as well. Okay? Uh, so that, that, I mean, that list right there is enough for me to say, hey, i got a good Easter sermon right there just in that. Okay? Uh, and again, we could talk about those in detail. Then our author talks about the history of the resurrection. And so um, you have people that have denied the his historicity of the resurrection, and so they've attacked it. Um, and he has a, a, you know, a section in there, rather, on um, historical evidences for the resurrection. Okay? So um, the fact is, the Bible says Christ Jesus was raised again from the dead, uh, and yet, as you guys know, anytime a conservative theologian or preacher or Bible believer like myself stands up and says, the Bible says he was raised again from the dead, Who are the, who's the boogeyman that's always out there? It's the liberal theologian, the guy that doesn't believe in anything. And there's the liberal standing up. Go ahead, sister. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, and you're, you're exactly right. Um, and they, they were a testimony of it. It sure was. You're exactly right. Those, those others that were raised, because the Bible says many saw those Old Testament saints. And so, um, you know, I, I, this is fanciful preaching. I can't, can't validate it, but there's, there's um, uh, let's see, I'm thinking by that time, there's old Lazarus. He's down there in paradise by this time because he's died again, maybe. Or some Old Testament saint, Abraham. Let's do Abraham. We'll do Abraham. All right, so Abraham, he's, he's down there in Hades, the paradise side of Hades. And he's in Abraham's bosom, and he's down there. And Jesus Christ is raised again from the dead. And he goes down, and he, um, um, he shouts victory. He looks over at the bad side of Hades, the, the, um, the um, Sheol side where um, people are tormented. And he says, nah, 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 nah. You know, but he, he takes all the Old Testament saints and he takes them with him. And so as he's going up and taking them to heaven, um, you know, old, old Abraham just says, you know what? I just got to get out and walk around a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus still allows some of them to do it. You know, again, it's fanciful preaching, but there were Old Testament saints that were raised um, with him. And you're right. In Paul's argument in Acts 15, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, there were eyewitnesses. 500 people saw him at once. So, and that's just Jesus, not to mention those other saints. But, um, you know, so that, that guarantees the fact we're not talking about people hallucinating. That was one of the charges you guys were, might remember. Oh, they were hallucinating or the disciples were hallucinating. Okay, so 500 people were hallucinating when they saw Jesus. That's just, you know, the only time that would happen is at a Woodstock concert, uh, you know, or something like that. But uh, listen... Um, 500 people don't hallucinate and see, you know, Jesus. Another thing is, is they went to the wrong tomb. Well, you know, um, again, when you look at everything that's said, or the disciples lied about it, uh, men will live for a lie, but very few men will die for a lie. And if the disciples just all got together and said, hey, let's, let's lie about the resurrection, what causes Peter to stand up on the day of Pentecost bold as a lion? It's the fact that they saw the living Christ, even, even traditionally called Doubting Thomas, was transformed. And all 11 out of the 12 disciples, Judas, of course, we know how he ended up, but the other 11, all of them became bold lions for their faith. John is the only one that lived to old age, and he was vanquished on the Isle of Patmos and um, ultimately died... Um, as an older man, but all the other disciples, they were martyred for their faith. Peter was crucified upside down, according to history, uh, church history. Um, men like Thomas, if I remember right, went overseas and preached. Um, and you had those types of things. And so those men were, and, and they were martyred. What explains that? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. They, they saw him and it transformed their lives. And so you've got those arguments right there. Um, you know, many 
eyewitnesses, the swoon theory, that's another theory. So, some, and this, again, those lib liberal theologians and Christ haters, well, he just kind of passed out. And he didn't die on the cross, he just passed out. And they wrapped him up. And when they put him in the tomb, the tomb, that cold air hit him. And then he kind of wakes up. He never really died. That's the swoon theory. He just swooned on the cross. Uh, which again, okay, then how do you explain the fact that not only did he um, come awake up after three days and three nights of swooning, uh, how do you explain the fact that he rolled that stone away by him? So, you know, the swoon theory is just ridiculous when you think of it. Um, but, it, they, you know, they're grasping at straws to try to deny um, our Lord's resurrection. Uh, and um, all these things are listed there, uh, and it is just, it just, it's a chapter that is just wonderful in terms of solidifying your faith in Christ Jesus. A uh, little bitty side note, I call it an excursus, is where did Jesus rise from the dead? You've heard me preach that I've been to both tombs, uh, and I have been to Israel two different occasions, and yes, you do. You go visit the garden tomb, uh, and the people that own that, I, I forgot that there's a denomination that sort of owns that land um, and you know they'll they'll convince you there's the skull you can still see it and uh, here's a uh, what was it he was buried near a um, oh gosh what is it what does the Bible say but anyway they'll show you um, evidence of the garden tomb and um, things of that nature and then they'll take you to the garden tomb and I mean a lot of people are convinced when they see that uh, but and by the way, I, I, I told you in there in, in the auditorium, I don't think that's where it happened. And, and our author even says it wasn't until the 20th century that they discovered that place that looked like the skull. And, um, and most likely it happened in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And if you look at these pictures, it amazed me. You've got the garden tomb there. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre does not look like you're outside the city gate and doesn't look like you know, where a tomb would be. Well, you got to remember, it's been 2,000 years. And the, the church builds um, temples or shrines, for lack of a better term. They put churches in these holy spots. So it's inside a church. It's a big, big building. And you walk there and, oh, that's the tomb. And then even the tomb itself is enshrined. Uh, and again, there's a good picture of it there. By the way, both pictures were taken by a Southwesterner, which I, I don't recognize his name, but obviously, um, by the seminary that I taught in. Uh, and so anyway, that's just interesting. I didn't know they were going to run that little rabbit uh, because I've been to both tombs. And I've always said I thought that it was personally the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, amen, it doesn't matter. And you don't have to go there. Uh, physically, not one iota. None of you guys need to spend any money on going to Israel because you know by faith he's not there. He's not there. Bad grammar, good preaching. All right. So, uh, all right. So then you got the ascension, which is vitally important. Jesus Christ was raised, and then he ascended back to the Father. And again, there's a litany there, brother Gary. You want to preach a, a, a three-part series, you know, on the resurrection, the ascension. The session, what's called the session of Christ, you got it right here. What did the ascension do? It demonstrated the lordship of Christ. What did it do? It inaugurated Christ's ministry as our great high priest. What did it do? It made possible the coming of the Holy Spirit. What did it do? It, it, it let us know that he was going to prepare a place for us in heaven. What did it do? It assured his followers that he will return visibly and gloriously. I mean, when he stepped off the Mount of Olives... And by the way, I just saw this depicted at, um, in Branson at the um, Sight and Sound Theater. And it's no matter where you see it depicted, it's always amazing. You know, there's Jesus talking to his disciples. And then, you know, he lifts up his hands and he just is carried into the clouds. But that's what it looked like in Acts 1. It says they were gazing at him. And um, then the angel says, go ahead. He was um, declaring to them that he was the priest. Um, yeah, he was blessing the people. That's exactly right. And uh, by the way, Gary, I don't know if you've heard my sermon on Luke, um, but the chapter begins. Don't get me preaching now, all right? But the chapter begins by um, a, a priest that cannot fulfill his priestly duties, right? Zacharias. And it ends with Jesus giving that 
that right. that he blessing. That's right. That's right. So, that's right. That's exactly right. So, that's good, isn't it? You stole that from me. You. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Good. You're good. <laughs> this past Sunday, you preached that. That's awesome, brother. That is awesome. So you got the ascension, and then you got something called the session. And again, if you're not familiar with that terminology, that's just talking about Jesus seated on the right hand of the Father and what he's doing there. He's obviously interceding for us. Um, he sends his Holy Spirit from that seated position. He intercedes for us. He rules over the church. Uh, he rules over all creation. And then, of course, you've got the return of Christ. Now, I separate them by the... Uh, seven years of trial and tribulation, but really that's one event. In the mind and in our, our minds, the rapture of the church and him coming and actually setting up his kingdom on earth um, is really just one event. Again, it's separated by the seven years of trial and tribulation, the day of the Lord, but the return of Christ um, does a number of things and that just guarantees, again, an, another litany here, the day of the Lord is getting kicked off at the return of Christ. Um, they tied the return of Christ to the completion of the Gentile mission. And um, they believe that Jesus, when he returns, he'll rule in their midst through the presence of the Holy Spirit, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, you've got everything. You're, you're covering everything there. His resurrection, his ascension, his session, him, him, him sitting next to God the Father on his right hand, and then his actual return. And um, it all is connected together. Uh, it's the resurrection is the inauguration of uh, the kingdom of God, and I'm glad that it's already not yet. Go ahead, Gary, as we close. Yeah. He's a prophet, he's a priest, and he's a king. You see it all, right? That's it. That's, absol that's it. That's, ex that's exactly right. And now let me run the rabbit. He's a prophet, so he declares God to the people, yep. right? Um, in being God's perfect representation. He's a priest. He made atonement for their sins. And he's a king. And by the way, that's in his session. He's seated as a priest and making intercession. Um, and then as a king... He comes back to set up his kingdom and actually rule from his, from his earthly throne, which is good, brother. That's good. Uh, all right. So isn't that a glorious chapter? That's a great chapter. It's all about Jesus, and you can't beat that.